Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, guys and gals, hey, thank you for tuning in to Super Agents Live. Uh, This show is the show on the web, on your radio, that delivers up the best content about building a business, finding a prosperous mindset, and building a well-balanced life. Hey, you know, look, I hope you're having a great summer. I certainly am. And for those of you listening in the future, this is being released August of 2014. Look, today, guys. Before we get into the content, I want to share a few things with you, what I've been doing. You know, I've spent the last week in Steamboat Springs, Colorado with an amazing group of guys. We had real estate guys there. We had stock market guys there, as well as one guy, this one guy who manages money. And he has a billion dollars, a billion with a B, under management. We all got together. We talked about business. We talked about passive income. We talked about how to improve our relationships, how to improve our health. And before we met, we all outlined our net worth. And we came, we came expecting to share that information with everybody. And you know, look, some of us are worth a million bucks. That's great, you know, look, you're a millionaire, good for you. Others of us were worth north of, uh, of us, uh, in the group, were worth north of $50 million. And I gotta tell you, being ready to share what your financial picture is and how each of us got there, you know, inspired a really magical thing. There was no ego there. Normally, you get 15 guys in a room and everybody's, you know, pushing, shoving, pushing their chests out and like, hey, you know, who's got the biggest, you know what? But in this group, you know, there was no, there was none of that. There was no politics. There was no jockeying for position. It was everyone listening, truly being helpful. They're honest, genuine. And overall, it was just a magical experience. So, man, I really hope all of you get a chance to do something like that. And look, you know, for you, if you, if you want me to start, you know, my audience is like that. Everybody wants to help and everybody's really cool. So if you want me to start putting together, you know, small events like this, I'll do it. Just let me know. So anyhow, speaking of, let's do a bit of housekeeping before we get to the show. First, the hashtag for this show is unpack that idea. It's a big follow train. And you just, you know what? You tweet out, use that hashtag and boom, you're plugging right into it. Secondly, Hopefully you know, uh, but if you don't, I, I just started talking about this in the last couple of episodes, but I am launching this whole platform, this whole show that I've built, it really has been a platform to launch a, a digital agency, a radio agency. If you want to add another 100 to 200 transactions to your deal flow, there's one way to do it. Oddly enough, radio advertising. Radio is not dead. Radio is alive and well, and it it, it can get you... It's literally, it's one. That's the one thing you can literally flip the switch and deals start coming in. So listen, we know all the tricks I've been building out for the last year. So check out our site, superagentslive.com if you want to learn more. And lastly, if you haven't dropped an iTunes or Stitcher review, man, I, I would appreciate it really much. Okay, listen, I know a bunch of you guys are like, hey, let's get to it already. All right, let's do it. Let's get to the show. Today on the show, we have a guy that came from humble beginnings and then went on to create an empire. We're going to talk about why it's important to have a financial mindset as well as why surrounding yourself with like-minded people is so important. I'm thrilled to welcome Tim Rode. Hey, Tim, thanks for taking the time out today. Hey, it's my pleasure, Toby. I hope I can uh, help your folks find uh, purpose, direction, and passion for their lives. (laughs) Right. That's okay. So look, so Tim, I know you have a, a, a pretty rich background, but maybe take a minute for people who are not familiar with you. And by the way, I, I don't know if I ever told you this, but a few people from the audience sent me emails and that's how you got on my radio. They said, hey, you need to have Tim on the show. So maybe take a minute. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and then uh, and what you're working on today. Cool. Well, my name's Tim Rode. I uh, live in Northern California. I came from, uh, like he said, humble beginnings, a uh, small town in Northern California called Portola. Uh, barely graduated high school, was a grocery clerk till I was 25, 
sold about 2,500 homes from uh, 1985 to 2000, then flipped about 50 homes from 2000 to 2005. And these days, I uh, basically retired, have a lot of passive income rolling in, and spend my time on a couple nonprofits I run and a for-profit business called GoBundance. So... That's about me and where I'm at. And one other thing I missed is I also ski probably about 75 days a year and spend three to four days a week doing what I call getting the goods in the woods. So, Getting the goods in the woods. What is that? (laughs) That's uh, hiking, biking, riking, skiing, just anything, anything fun in the boonies or at a lake. I I really enjoy outdoors, nature, and I live up on a mountain. And spend a lot of my time outdoors, just just enjoying life. Yeah, that's awesome. And I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but listen, are you are you a speed guy or are, are you a turn guy? Do you like to turn? Um, I would say somewhere in the middle, kind of like a GS guy. Actually, I'm more of a climb guy than anything else. My favorite thing is backcountry skiing. Mm-hmm. I love to climb mountains and then um, ski down them. So. Interesting, man. Uh, yeah, my again, we're I don't want to get too far off topic, but I'm my background's a climber, so I've done I've done uh, I did the North Face of Shasta, I did you know Mount Rainier, obviously. Um, I, I would love to do uh, what's the one? Um, what's the big one? Uh, McKinley. Oh yeah, in Alaska. In Alaska, I'd love to do that one. That one's gnarly though. Um, anyhow, I, you know I think really what's next on my list is Akakangwa, which so you know that's you know plus you know twenty thousand plus. Are you familiar with that? That it, whatever. Let's get back to let's get back to business. So, look, you were a grocery clerk till you're 25. What what is up with that? I mean, you, you, did you not have a a mindset of of that you were going to pursue wealth or or I mean, I I don't I don't quite understand that. Well, I just kind of got off to a late start in life. I'll be honest with you. I was a uh, middle of four kids growing up in a small rural community. Uh, my parents split up when I was young. I uh, kind of went in the wrong direction. I uh, lived in the child of the 70s. I, it was kind of like sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and kind of went a little off the, to the left turn. And then I had um, two small kids around 23, uh, was still a grocery clerk, got my real estate license, um, sold two, two homes and listed one my first weekend in real estate, at 25, and I knew wow. it was on for me. Wow. I had, uh, I've always had a sales mind and a sales background. Found the right vehicle, and right time, right place. I was off to the races. That's amazing, man. Uh, your first week, and you did three deals. I mean, you sold two and got a listing. Well, I, I held an open house. I sold it. I listed their house, and I took a buyer out and sold their house. Amazing. Amazing. Well, so look, you know, here's the thing. So, you know, I kind of get your, you know, you kind of took a left turn. You had two kids, I think you said at 23, which is super young. Uh, you didn't have a whole lot of direction growing up. Um, most people get into real estate for they, they want financial freedom and they want time freedom. And the problem is they abuse the time freedom and they never get to financial freedom. Now, for you, like, did that just when you had kids, did the baby effect kick in? And you're like, I'm, I'm all business. Yeah, I think that's what happened is is uh, just having my first son made me realize um, I need to provide financial security for my family. That's my basically my duty, and, and it snapped me into a mindset of I want to work hard, I want to uh, live within my means, and I think that's a really important point along the way that people miss is is the living within your means. So, so I, uh, for the next basically 15 years, I listed about 15 to 20 homes every month. And I, uh, we still lived like I was a grocery clerk and we lived way within our means. We, we did our ABCs, which, uh, a is what's coming in per month. B is what's going out per month and C is what's left to invest, or unfortunately, in many people's case, what's left for debt reduction yeah. because of the mistakes they made earlier in life. So that's one thing. Um, biggest thing I can uh, tell your audience that made a difference in my life towards financial freedom is know your ABCs. 
Um, yeah, so look, that you're, you're touching on something kind of interesting there, for me at least. So, so you said a couple things. One is you wanted to have financial freedom. And then you said we lived way within our means. Now, the, the, I want to talk from the business side, and then we'll get to the personal piece. But a lot of people, they, they fail. You, look, if you have a business, you have to invest both in yourself as well as in your business. Now, if you have this mindset of living within your means, right, and, and making sure that you have ample capital, um, it, it seems to me that you, would, you might have a problem with going out and spending $2,000 a month or, five, or whatever it is on marketing. Right. You have to invest in that. I mean, was that a struggle with you? I mean, how did you get to the 10 to 15 listings a month? Well, well, you said something that I want to make sure you touch on yeah. that we touch on. And that's investing in yourself. Yeah. Um, barely graduated high school. I never went to college. I couldn't. I was too ADD to listen to a professor drone on and on about something that just didn't interest me. And I'm being honest here. But but what I did invest in was um, like like things related to where I was, learning all I could about real estate, all I could about sales, all I could about investing. I've over the years spent somewhere around 100000 maybe more on my own personal development, and I feel like that was money well spent. As far as uh, spending on marketing, when I first got in the business, uh, I didn't have any money to spend on marketing. I had... I had very little money, and and what we what I did was I, I worked harder than anybody else. Hmm. Every single morning, seven a.m., I cranked up the song uh, "Welcome to the Jungle" by Guns N' Roses, and uh, drove to my office with that just blaring in my ears, <laughs> and uh, and and hit the ground running towards what do I have to do today to, to uh, go list a home. And, and that was my focus. Is every day I worked, I wanted to list a home. And I played a game with myself. Uh, I wanted to go on three listing appointments and, and list a home every day. We didn't work with buyers once I'd been in the business four or five years. I concentrated solely on listings. And I prospected three hours every day except I played a game with myself. If I had three listing appointments, I didn't have to prospect that day. If I had two listing appointments, I had to prospect one hour. If I had one listing appointment, I had to prospect two hours. And if I had no listing appointments, I had to prospect three hours. And I was religious about that. Nothing got in my way of the prospecting. And, and I know a lot of the people in the business know this, of how important that dialing for dollars is. That was a huge part of... Uh, what I did to build my business. We didn't spend a lot on marketing at first. Over time, as my, as I was bringing in more money, we increased our marketing budget. I created my own slogan, call Tim Road and start packing. And I'm going to touch on that in a second. But um, that that was, we marked, everything we did was centered around that slogan. And I just read a book called Start With Why, when I was selling real estate, my why was to come through for my clients. I was a fierce advocate for my clients. And uh, the call Tim Road and start packing was, was a way of doing business. It wasn't call me for a no-cost, no-obligation um, marketing plan. Don't call me if you want to list your home too high because I will not take it. Call me when you want to freaking move. And that was our whole... Um, that was our whole basis was we listed the homes right, a fair product at a fair price. We got all the inspections up front. I've never understood why you can buy a car and, you know, like walk into the dealership, buy a car and be out that afternoon. Why does a real estate deal fall through on the 30th day or the 45th day? So, so I wanted to own cut the crap real estate. Um, like I'm going to list a home. I'm going to do everything right up front. I'm going to have my seller all ready and motivated for the willing buyer who's all pre-qualified and ready to go on the other side. We can have a nice, simple transaction that closes as quickly and efficiently as possible. Okay. There's, there's a lot of stuff in there. So, so, um, 
on the dialing for dollars thing, right? So I imagine, again, you're a grocery clerk, so you don't necessarily have a big database, right? You don't necessarily have a sphere of influence that, that you could dig into. So you, it was all cold calls with you. It, 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 did I get that right? Pretty much. Okay. I, I'd say so, yeah. So we, um, I didn't have many. I started off with, with just a few, and honestly, my first few years in the business, I really didn't work on building my database. A lot of the things I did were trial and error, and then um, by going to uh, Mike Ferry, Howard Brenton, other you know national um, conventions and stuff like that, and learning from people outside my community, I saw what the best of the best were doing and literally emulated them. Okay, so so um, so you, you, it was it was all dialing for dollars, as you said. Now you were deliberate, right? You were del- You had this vision in your mind. You said, "I want to get a listing today." And I, you know, if you don't, if you want to list it for more than it's worth, or you want to list it a little bit down the road, I'm not interested in you. How important for you, Tim, is it that being deliberate with what you want? Do you uh, you you somehow manifested these three appointments a day? You know, in terms of manifesting what you, your vision, I mean, it's a a lot of people can't get their heads around that. So maybe maybe you can unpack that for us a bit. Well, let let me back up a bit. Okay. Um, I, I, if you didn't want to list today, that's fine. You'd, you'd be a C lead. Um, I, you know, let's say your daughter graduates from high school a year and a half from now, then, then I would put that in my notes and I'd call you every three months and follow up. And, and then like three months before, maybe I'd come over and talk to you about what, what you should do to prepare. And at that point you're a B lead. And then, you know, there, she's going to graduate in June of, 2017 let's say and we put your home on the market in March 2017 well when I call you February 1st you're an A-lead at that point if that makes sense yeah yeah what I would what I wouldn't do was I go to list your home March 1st all of the comparables say um let's that that uh, that it's going to appraise and eventually sell around 200,000 and granted everybody's in um up markets down markets you know you got to look at what kind of market you're in but for the most part I would not list your home like many will at 250 right and let's start there and we can always go down but not come up I didn't play that game hmm. I looked at what's the most I could possibly get for this home and, and and get it appraised and get the job done for them. And and you can tell I was I, I never took myself serious. And anybody who saw me during my real I bungee jumped with a briefcase with I go to I jump at the chance to go to work for you. And I read, <laughs> rode my tricycle down Main Street and did pictures on top of and let Tim Rowe get on top of selling your house. We did all sorts of fun stuff to to create a an image of a fun-loving, easy-going guy, but but as far as getting your home sold and working with others in the community, I was a fierce advocate for my clients and uh, really looked at, you know, asked a lot of questions for trying to find out exactly what it is they're trying to do and then took it really serious to come through for them. Okay. No, that's great. I, I mean, I love that. I love that, uh, that, that self-promotion. But I, again, I want to go back to manifesting this because I had a guy, I don't know if you know who he is, Thatch Nguyen. Great, great guy. And his bit was a little bit like yours. His deal was, I want to find somebody, and it wasn't one day or that day, but he said, I want to find somebody who's going to list their house this week. And if you don't want to list your house this week, he actually didn't put them in his database. And his, his deal is he knocked on 100 doors a day for 10 years. And what he explained to us on the show, he said, when you have that, I want to find someone who's going to list their house in the next seven days. He said, when you look at the crowd, right, your radar, that's who you pick up. And if they're not, they don't have that, you, your radar won't even pick them up. And I'm just wondering if there's something similar with you. Um, and, and keep in mind, I'm going back 15 years Got now. It. Yeah, okay? sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But, but uh, yeah, I was, I gave up, you give off a vibe. You give off, and, and that's what this is all about, is you give off this vibe of, of I'm busy, I'm hardworking, and most of all, I'm competent. That's what they're looking for is somebody I'd go on listing appointments and I could just feel people take a deep breath and go, finally, someone that knows what they're doing that, that is going to take me under their wing and get the job done for me. 
And where I may be different from, I think you said his name was Thad, is, is yes, I was looking for a home I could list that day, but I, but I was wise enough to know, um, you know, you got to work under other people's parameters. And maybe there's somebody out there who wants to list and sell today, but I want to talk to everybody in my community and, and, you know, even if you notice, I said, go on three listing appointments and take one. Well, some people say, wow, Tim, that's a lousy, um, what, lousy spread between how many you go on and how many you take. Well, the thing is, is I wouldn't mind going on one six months, nine months ahead of time just to get to know them, just to sit down face to face. And some people may look at that as a time waster. I was in a small community of like 75,000 people. There were 150 agents. And at one point, I was doing somewhere like 10 to 15% of the business in town myself. Hmm. And I and you can imagine I was getting a lot of flack from the other agents. You know, it's a very competitive business. There, there were some things said that weren't quite true um, as far as, you know, I'm not even going to get into it, but, but all I wanted to do was meet as many people face to face and ha- and look them in the eye and show them how much I cared, how hard I was willing to work for them and, and how much of coming through for them was important to me. Right, right. So, right. And I, and I think, I think that's the vibe that you really gave off, right? That's, that's why you probably were so successful, right? So you, you know, you're, you outworked everybody. And what you said earlier to me, you said, Hey, I am, I wanted to be the advocate for the people that I work with. And I, I'm sure that that, you know, you believe that your belief was I'm, I'm your advocate. I'm on your team. And I think when you most, I don't want to, I want, I'm saying, I think, but I want you to talk about it. When you sat down across from people, I'm sure they, they felt that and they're like, you know what? I'm in good hands. Yeah. I'm Tim's my guy. Not only did they feel it, um, I think one of my secret weapons was was a line I'd use. When I go to work for you, I look at it like a, like we're part of a team. We're going to be working together on this. My job is to get as many motivated, qualified buyers to your door. Your job is to have the home stick out over all the competition. Together, we're going to set the right price for your home. But what I'm going to do for you is take you under my wing and make sure as best I can that all these details in the transaction all work out so we can get you happily moved within within your time frame, accomplishing everything for you. So in other words, the, the key to that was it's kind of like it's you and I against the market. Right, right, right. And you were also, it sounds like you were also kind of a coach for these people, right? I'm going to guide you through the process. Um <clears throat> You mentioned earlier, and, 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 and I'm talking to the audience really quickly. So Tim mentioned earlier a book that he, his last book, it was Start With Why. And if you're not familiar with that, uh, it's by a guy named Simon Sinek. And you should today, right now, once you get done listening to him, go Google Simon Sinek, Start With Why. There's a great TED Talk that you should listen to. <clears throat> now, I, I bring that up, and I, I kind of came back to that, Tim, because you talked about your why. You knew your why, and that and your your purpose, right? You were purposeful and deliberate. And that is the thing that you said was really helpful. But maybe talk, can you talk to us a little bit about why people should find their why and how to go about doing it? Well, so, so first let me give you a belief I have. Okay. Um, one of my mentors, Dr. Fred Gross, and I'm sure a lot of you are shaking your head smiling right now. If you know, Dr. Fred, G R O S S E. Google him also. He's one of David Osborne, Pat Hybens, and I, um, personal mentors. And Dr. Gross taught us this concept of uh, incarnate, multiple incarnations in life. And there's some of you out there who are 50, 60, 70, listening to this, still selling real estate, and very happy that you're still selling real estate. I knew I had a different purpose than just listening and selling real estate. Back probably hit me around 30 years old. It was, it, the question that comes through my head, why are you doing this? Why are you working so hard? What's this all about? What's your big why, Toby? That's what we're talking about. So for me, it was, I don't want to do this forever. I, I had a few goals in my mind. I wanted to be a millionaire by, by the time I was 40. And I wanted also by the time I was 40 to have the option to do something else if I chose to. And that was my big loss was, was I'm going to, so here I am. It's kind of like a a race. Here I am. It's 30 and at 40, I've got to build up 
enough um, passive income coming in to where I choose. If I still want to sell real estate, that's great. But if I choose I want to do something else, that's okay too. And and since um, since 40, I'm now 54, I've had three different incarnations. Um, and, and about every five years, I, I start something new. I get a little bored with what's behind me and, and, and start something new. And I, I think that's a great way to go through life is to, is to keep – Keep expanding, keep growing, keep looking for the the next what's next for you and your life. And everybody's different in this, but that that was my big why was I wanted to hit forty with enough passive income coming in to where I can choose what I get to do when I wake up the next day. That's interesting, man. That's interesting. Um, n- number one, I- I'm sure you know today that that shooting for a million net worth or even a million in cash by 40 that wasn't a big enough goal for you um but you know is can your why really be that can your why be a financial why or should it be more purposeful right like you know um uh, people over profits or some weird thing i don't know but but you you know what i'm trying to get at right i mean can can that be is is that a valid why saying i want to be a millionaire by 30 40 whatever well, here was my thought process, and I didn't know it at the time, but now looking back, it was kind of like what they say when you're on an airplane, you got to put the mask on you first. Yeah. And and that was me putting the mask on me. And uh, I, w- I was very, I said this before, I was very serious about providing for my family's financial security. I wanted to get that all dialed in, and then I wanted to figure out what's next. And, and to get even more, if you will, selfish, <laughs> From 40 to 45, if you would have met me around 43, and that's when I met David Osborne and Pat Hyman, um, and said, hey, Tim, what do you do? I'd say, well, I ski. And you'd go, what do you mean you ski? And and that was, in my mind, my career during that time frame. I was uh, learning. I just took up backcountry skiing. There was a lot to learn, like, like avalanche awareness, backcountry survival, wilderness first aid. And it was kind of like I was in school learning all of those things and it's kind of helped me like our go penance business is um adventure mastermind so we do a lot of things out in the boonies and and i didn't know it but but all of those classes i took are serving me real well with what we're doing now and it's it's really funny but but if you ask me my purpose now my purpose is to help it's kind of like i've seen oz i've seen how all of this works and now I want to take as many with me as possible. And and what your why is doesn't matter. And uh, my nonprofit, One Life Fully Lived, um, helps people with purpose and direction. And we don't care what your why is. As long as it's legal, moral, and ethical, we want to provide tools for free to help you get there. So... Interesting. Um, so I, I want to spend a few more minutes on this before we get to, to the next topic. But um, so. Oh, man, um, I don't even really know how to ask that. Maybe, maybe we can round back to it. But so let's get into let's get into personal development. Right. So early you said you spent about, you you know, in your life, you spent about 100 grand on personal development. Now, uh, I want to get into that. I'll, let me ask this first. What and I, I this is a question I ask every now and again, but, you know, Let's say that I make a hundred grand a year, right? Or I make five hundred grand a year. Whatever the number is, what percentage of my net income uh, should I spend on personal development every year? Well, um, if you, and, and there's a big difference between. Let me let me let me clarify something. Okay. The, you you said if I make a hundred grand or five hundred grand. I don't know if that's a net or gross number. No, I said and net. I can't. Oh, okay. All right. So, so let me just touch on this. So, um, I, I once met a realtor who said, Tim, I want you to kind of help me with my finances. I go, great. How much are you making a year? She goes, I make 900 grand a year. I said, how much are you spending? She said somewhere between 700 grand and 1.2 million. I'm really not sure. Yeah. (laughs) So, so go back to those ABCs I talked about before. I think that is the hugest thing to know is what's coming in, what's it costing me to run my business, and what am I netting? And if you're listening to this 
and you don't do that, if you get one thing out of this whole interview, please know your ABCs. That's such a huge thing. I can't tell you, I've met, I probably met 50,000 real estate agents and, and every single one of them wants to pull off the financial freedom thing. And I know fewer than, uh, let's say, 500 out of those 50,000. And that's like, what, 10 per, that's like 1%, maybe, maybe 2% out of all the agents I've met have pulled off with that, you know, to be an, to be able to retire if they chose. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's how important that is to me. But, but to answer your question on what you should spend um, on your personal development, I'd say, you know, somewhere like 5% maybe. If okay. you're making 100 grand a year, if you spent 5,000 a year, that's probably a good, good number. If you're making 500 grand, 25 grand, um, I, you might splurge for one big thing. Uh, in 2000, I put my wife and I through Tony Robb's Life Mastery at $20,000. And I've had people say, how'd that work for you? It changed my life. It absolutely, you know, changed my life. As did go and see Jim Rohn. As did spending a year being mentored by Dr. Fred Gross. As did um, having a guy named Ron Garber coach me for a year. A lot of, lot of different little things you can point to that, you know, just along my path that helped me get to where I want to go. And I'm not certainly not done spending on my um, continuing education. Yeah. Well, going back to your ABC thing, you know, what you said earlier, and I, I've, I, you know, that girl that said, how much do you make? I make 900. I have a buddy who's a chiropractor. His third year, is he, you know, we're at a party. He takes, I don't know, he was trying to big time everybody, which was retarded, well, dumb. So he takes out his wallet, throws it on the thing. He's like, man, I, make, I made 600 grand last year, and I'm not happy. And I'm like, hold on a second. Because I was, at that time, I was netting like 600 grand. I'm like, I know how you live. You, you're not making 600 grand. I'm like, help me understand that. And finally, and he couldn't, like, he really honestly couldn't explain it. He just knows I made 600 grand. And, and basically, that's his top line number. I'm like, but you don't make that, dude. I mean, I guess you could think about it in some way that you did make that because you, 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 you did whatever it is to bring it in. But what you, your net, that's all you make is what you net after taxes. Um, it's amazing. Right. I think if people have that mindset of my top line number is what I've made, um, I'm not sure how you're going to ever turn that around and really, you know, build a real business. Right. Well, if you look at the awards banquet, it's what did you gross and how many deals did you make? Right. And, and they don't look at the what did you net. And, uh, you know, one thing that, that David Osborne helped me work on is, um, and I, I love his concept of um, being a hundred percenter, meaning a hundred percent of your bills are covered through passive income. And that's another good thing to look at is right now, maybe I'm at 17%. I, uh, my bills are 10,000 a month and I'm not talking about what you make in real estate. I'm talking about what comes in from rentals, notes, other businesses you own or businesses you invest in and maybe um so if you're making if your bills are ten thousand and you have seventeen hundred a month passive coming in then you're a seventeen percenter if, and maybe your goal for the next year is to put is to work all year to bring that number up to twenty two percent then it goes to thirty five and then you look at five years later and it's at a hundred and twelve percent and if you've never played the game cash flow I highly recommend it it you in this game you do exactly what we're talking about. You're, you're given a career, you're a janitor, you're a teacher, you're an airline pilot, and you play the whole game is to get out of the rat race. And that's what all, a lot of our dependents friends are, are, are focusing on with their finances and with their business side of things is how can I have my passive income be bigger than what my um, expenses are that gets me, quote, out of the rat race and then you get on the fast track and you can start doing more and more investing and, and choose whether you want to work or not or ski 75 days. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, you know, that's interesting. So, so isn't it, uh, isn't it Kiyosaki? He talks about, he talks about, 
he talks about dollars and freedom and his bit I, I i think it's i'm pretty sure it's robert kiyosaki but it's it's um he says that you know let's say that your bills are five thousand grand you five grand a month but you have 10 grand in the bank that means that you have two months of financial freedom right so that's that's one lens to to view money and time freedom but but the way um you guys are looking at it is is passive income to pay your 100 percent of your bills Correct. So, okay. so you go buy a rental, and the net income from it, because we all know there's, you know, repairs and things come up. Let's take a, a note. Let's say you loan somebody a hundred grand at ten percent, and you get ten thousand a year coming in from that. Then, then you know that's eight hundred a month passive income coming in. And if your bills are eight thousand a month, then you have ten percent of your bills covered through passive income, and and that's the whole game is to try and get to where a hundred percent of your bills are covered without. And here's the key: without you having to work. That's that's yeah. the. No, that's, that's the game we play. And look, first of all, for everybody, I'm going to the next the next month. Tim and I and David Osborne, all those guys are going to hang out with his Go Abundance group. And I'm going, Tim. I'm going because, see, I don't. For me, I don't look at that stuff, right? You know, it, you know, I'll take a hundred grand and I'll throw it in a deal, right? So I will take a hundred grand, throw it in a deal where I can make thirty. So for me, I'm like, okay, that's cash on cash is thirty. But when you look at an, an, an internal rate of return, maybe I made that thirty grand that, and thirty percent. You know, maybe I made that in one month. So my whole career has been based on doing deals like that. <clears throat> Not and I do have four rentals, so it's a, that's a little bit. But I have a lot of cash tied up in that. So the return on that is much lower than me doing a deal. And I'm I'm struggling with this this whole horizontal income thing. Uh, I'm struggling with you know what is the what is the fastest way to financial freedom. So let's touch on that. Yeah. Um, I, t- I told you for um, five years, I flipped homes. Okay. Yeah. And I flipped 10 homes a year. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. 10 homes a year around one a month. And I went from prospecting three hours a day. I had this big team in real estate and we're selling as much as we can. And then I kind of got bored with that. And then I flipped homes. So I took a few of my team. I kept them on. They helped me flip homes, and uh, and we and we were extremely successful. We flipped fifty, and we made a good profit on forty-eight out of fifty. We netted approximately forty per home, so that's two million dollars over a five-year period. Okay. Yep. Um, I looked up in two thousand and six, and and I went forty-eight and two. The two I didn't make money on were the last two I did. That market was done. Yep. If 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 I didn't siphon money off, and and that was the only game I had going, I would have been crushed in 2006. Luckily, while I'm flipping those homes, I think I owned seven homes when I started everything, seven properties, I should say, because uh, I want to talk about what to buy. Um, I, I owned, when I sold everything in 2005 and moved up to the mountains, I had, I had acquired 10 more properties during that flipping period. Because what I did, Toby, is we still, and, and, and I'm not suggesting people be a pauper and not enjoy life, but, but, but too many enjoy life a bit too much. Yeah. And, and instead of taking that 30 grand per deal you talked about, of the 40 I was making per mine, um, we would buy a, like, like three or four rental properties and duplexes and land in the path of growth and other properties that I could siphon off and, and put to work for me to where um, you don't be have to work if you don't choose. And and you talked about horizontal income. This is a term David Osborne came up with. Everybody wants a bigger paycheck. That's vertical income. One paycheck bigger. I want to get a raise. I want to go from sixty thousand to a hundred thousand. From a hundred to two hundred thousand. We believe in horizontal income. I think Osborne has like a hundred and thirty checks coming in. Um, Hyben has 47 checks coming in. I think I have 32 checks coming in, and that's without working. Those are paychecks coming in from different sources without us having to work. Go back to when I was flipping homes, I had to work to do that. 
when you were flipping homes right, and, and are flipping homes, you're working to do it. Those are earned income versus passive income. Mm-hmm. If, if somebody else is flipping the home and you're investing in their project, that's passive income. Okay. So, so, uh, I, I want to touch on one more thing along those lines. The things I bought were, uh, that, that I think helped me the most is, is land in the path of growth. That was, that was something that, that really, um, what's the word? Turbocharged my, our, my financial getting somewhere. As an example, I, uh, I bought a home off somebody for like, uh, I think I paid them ten grand, took over their loan, and and a year later our market had increased a lot, and I sold that. It was about a year and a half later, and this is in Cali in the mid two thousands. It went up about a hundred and twenty thousand, and I I exchanged that property into a piece of land in the path of growth with an old house on it. And I took that 120 and put it down for three on a 360 purchase. And two years later, that piece of land had appreciated from 360 to a million eighty. Nice. So, so the 10 grand that went into the 120 grand that sold for a million eighty is now a building I own leased to AutoZone in Knoxville, Tennessee. And it brings me in eight grand a month. So, so I took ten grand, and in two moves turned it into eight thousand a month, with a twenty-year lease on it, with a quality triple net tenant. You know that that I'm not fixing their roof. I'm right. not right. Yeah, the AC goes out. It's on them. <clears throat> Look, I mean, those, those. I love to hear. I mean, we all. If you have spent time investing, you know, there that. You know, those are kind of the unicorns, right? Those are few and far between. Um, I mean, I, I love the story, but you know, I and I and I understand your point. Let me let me, let me talk about ask about passive income for a second. So, I I, I go and live. If I'm going to flip a house, I go. I have to find the deal. It takes time, and energy. I have to fix it up, and then I have to put it for sale. Right? I'm earning whatever income I make off that. You said earlier, Tim. You said okay. You know, maybe you just invest in somebody else's deal, right? Whatever that is, right? Um, you throw some money in, and then when you get paid, and and Hyben calls it, uh, at least he did on on my show, he called it mailbox money. And I love that term, mailbox money, right? Um, but but what about risk? You know, if I'm having uh, the when I have lost money on deals, it is it is it has been on those deals that were more passive than me being very involved. I totally agree with that as much as you can um, to, to alleviate the risk. You're never going to, to minimize the risk. You're never going to totally get rid of it. Here's, here's some things I highly recommend you do. First of all, as much as you can invest in your own area, if that's all mm-hmm. possible. Yep. Second, um, you've heard the term, and I know a lot of the people listening are, are in the real estate business. You've, you've heard them say, well, it's not fair. The realtors see all the, fir- the best deals first. Well, absolutely correct. And, and when I was in the trenches listing and selling real estate, I got lucky a, numer- a number of times. You talked about a unicorn. I totally disagree with that statement, hmm. Toby. Okay. I, uh, and, and, and here's a few things that, that why I do. Um, if you're in the trenches and you're an expert in your market and you know what's going on and you're paying attention and your reticular activators are fully awake, you're going to come across them. And if you, if you have in your mind, I am an investor. I'm not just listing and selling real estate. This is a huge point. Mm-hmm. You see yourself as an investor. You're wide open to opportunities. Let me give you an example. An agent walked in. Uh, to our office, and I was never in a private office. I was always right out in the middle of everything. And and uh, one agent is presenting a counter offer to another agent and says, "Hey, by the way, I just listed eight units out on Frisbee." Boom! My reticular activators immediately wake up. I go, "What you go?" He goes, "Oh, it's eight units for two sixty nine." I just go, "Bargain." I go, what the, have you put it on MLS? No, it's going on later today. Um, where is, what's the address? He gives me the address. I drive out there. Um, 
I, I uh, little little pushy, <laughs> knock on somebody's door. Hey, do you mind if I come through? Oh, gee, gee, blah blah blah. Here's twenty bucks. Let me let me walk through your unit. Um, I walk through their unit. I uh, I can just see, you know, because I'm an expert in the market. I know prices. I know value. This thing's listed a hundred grand under value in a hot rising market. I call the other agent. I go, hey. Don't put it on MLS. I want to present with you my full price, all cash, close in 30 days, as is offer. I buy it for 269. I sell it a year and a half later for like 475. It was, um, you know, right place, right time. Making, I jumped in my car right then. I knew the market. I was an expert, and I got 10 more stories like that of of. Being, you know, being in the trenches in my market. And one other thing I want to say, Toby, along those lines of, of eliminating risk is um, track trends. Hmm. Uh, I sold real estate from 1986 and moved out of the area in 2005, but only sold till 2000. But every single month I track um, the MLS stats, how many homes are on the market, how many new listings came on, what went pending, what went sold, and, and how many did that leave. And we graphed it. Every three months, we graphed it. I knew when our market was peaking. I knew when our market was tanking. I knew how much inventory was on. I was, I was an expert. I was in the freaking trenches. And I knew all this stuff, and I, and, you know, I was curious. And so guess what? In 1997, when our market bottomed out, buy, Winthorpe, buy! In 2005, when, when our market absolutely peaked, I sold 17 properties right into our peak, and, and I couldn't have hit it any better, and then it tanked the next year. Sell, Winthorpe, sell! <laughs> so, uh, well, so, so, um, that's from trading places, so. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't remember that line, but I love it. Um, so the, uh, you said a couple of important things, um, you know, right. You disagree that, that those were unicorns because for, I want to make a couple points. One, um, on that, the deal that you, that you bought, that you ended up selling for like four sixty, uh, that was undervalued. And, and when you make money is when you buy it. It's not when you sell it, right? I mean, you can sure. buy something and hope for that appreciation, but really you want to buy so you want to make money the day you buy it. Now, for you, I think one of the important things that you touched on, you said you you really talked about mindset because you said, you know, you have to see yourself as as an investor, you always have to have your reticular, right? You have to have your know, um uh opportunity awareness. And then you have to jump. Um can you can you talk about the mindset a bit, Tim? Sure. Well, um, and, and something you said brought up something I did uh, as far as uh, you make money when you buy. Yeah. When, when I uh, decided I'm going to be an investor, I did two things. Number one, I wrote, Tim is now an investor plan. And every time I've done a new incarnation, I've kind of planned it all out. And this is Tony Robbins planning. What's my outcome? What's my purpose? What's my action plan? Um, where am I going to find the deals? Where am I going to find the money? I laid all of that out. Okay. And that was, that was one big thing. The second thing I did is, well, how are you going to do this? So where am I going to find the deals? Think of if you're in a boat and, and you want to catch fish, you're best to have a fish finder. Where are the fish? So, uh, we looked at, um, sources and a system. Uh, I call them fishing lines in the water. We had 13 different sources to find deals, and we worked every one of those sources, okay? Okay. And, and, and that's what our, our thing was. And you got to go with the premise. Um, that out of 100 sellers, 98% of them w- want top dollar. Real world, mm-hmm. and can't blame them. When, you, when we sell, we want top dollar. 2% don't care about top dollar, just want the darn thing done. And, and that was my, uh, my shtick was, and, and by the way, for the first 15 years in the business, I wanted to list and sell real estate. And then we absolutely cut that off. And I want to touch on something with that in a minute about Pat Hyden versus Tim Road. Um, so, so I cut that off. I, I just basically dropped my real estate business. I went from listing 15 to 20 homes a month to nothing within like two years. It was amazing how fast all that dried up because I chose to. But um, so when we went to 
we, we transition to, I don't want to list and sell your home. I just want to buy your home. And we literally contacted at the time. My database was 2,500 people with, uh, we want, um, want top, if you want to sell your home in a hurry, we won't pay anywhere near retail. But if what's most important to you is a quick, efficient sale, I can have cash for you within seven days. So, um, and we have to start wrapping up, Tim. I mean, dude, I could literally talk to you probably for two hours, but, but, um, keeping that in mind. So, so you, you have, you had 13 lines in the water. You had 13 sources where you were looking for deals and you were again, del- just like you were deliberate about getting somebody who wanted to list that day. You know, you're deliberate about finding things because, you know, for people in the audience that, that, that want to model Tim road, what, what, what do those lines look like and how can, uh, how can somebody go out and sort of replicate that in their market? Well, what, what I would do is, is, you know, obviously, if somebody was delinquent on their home, we looked at who might they talk to if they were going to want to sell. We, we, so we went after, like, accountants, attorneys, um, we, and those you could possibly get bulk business from. Uh, we had a lady who had an old folks home, and, and she had a stack of our business cards in there. And if somebody, let's say mom took a bad fall and, and, you, and she lives in Albuquerque and you're coming in from Phoenix and Seattle to come help her and you walk into the old folks home and they give you, hey, this guy's not going to give you retail, but, but if you just want to check this week, here you go. Um, so we, we, we thought out of the box of who might want to sell and then develop systems around them if that makes sense. And by the way, if anybody wants a copy of any of this, just send me uh, um, your email to tim at timroad.com and I can give you my Tim is now an investor plan and my sources, prospecting sources. That's awesome, man. Uh, yeah, well, you don't know, send that to me. I will have this stuff. Uh, you can certainly get it from Tim, um, but I will have this on the show notes. So, um, yeah, send it to me. I'll, I'll if you don't have my email, you have my email. Anyhow, uh, okay. Hey, uh, again, in the in the for time, dude. Uh, look, I'm gonna ask you something I don't normally ask. I ask very few people this, but this interview has been very very different than than what our typical stuff is, which is great. <laughs> but what's what's something I didn't ask you, Tim, that I should have asked you for the audience? Um. I appreciate that. Ask me about my nonprofit, One Life Fully Lived. Get in One there. Life Fully. Yeah. What is yep, it? Yep. Yep. It is a uh, nonprofit I started about four years ago. Uh, our motto is "Dream it, plan it, live it." Our thought process is: everybody has a dream. Few make a plan for their dream, and very few are living their dream. And our uh, community is is based on helping people find what they want and go after it. We're having a conference in Reno, Nevada, in November. It costs seventy five dollars for two days. Incredible presenters like David Osborne, Pat Hyben, Rock Thomas, all of our GoBundance elders are there. My good friend Chris Lockhead, who's just killing it in Silicon Valley. People who have started from humble beginnings, made incredible lives for themselves and care deeply about having others find their dreams. And it costs 75 bucks for two days. And the reason we have it so cheap is so you will jump on a plane and come join us in Reno, Nevada in November. Yeah. You know what, dude, you should think about putting me on that list. Uh, I'll, I'll present for you. Hey, you know what? I mean, you know what's funny is, is I want to talk briefly about that costing thing because – there, I believe, and I want to get your thoughts on this, is that I, I try to do the same thing. I try to, you know, part of the show, you know, we, we have some products and programs behind it. And I, and I wanted to create a pricing model where no matter where you were, right, you could participate. And what I, it, it, it seems to me when I throw something out that is high value but super cheap or, or you know, like the two days, 35 bucks a day. You know, you, that you can go and listen to, to people who've done it. That's incredible. But, you know, there's, there's perceived value in the marketplace. Uh, and I think that it seems to me that, you know, when realtors see something that is, that is priced very cheaply like this, that the perceived value is, goes way down. Don't you think you'd have, I don't know, talk to me about what your thoughts are on that. I, I totally agree with you. Um, if, if we charged, you know, 500 a day, which is more what this is worth and more in line with what, what somebody would normally charge, 
um, people would get a much more perceived value out of it. The only reason we do it so inexpensive is so people will jump on a plane and bring their struggling nephew with them, you know? Mm, yeah. So so that's our thought process is we just want to help a lot of different people from a lot of different worlds. So, Got But it. I totally agree with what you're saying as far as personal people. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, because I'm, I, again, you know, I'm struggling pricing my stuff. If I say, hey, this thing is 199 bucks, I get a few people going raising their hand but if i say hey this same product if i say that this same product is 399 or 499 um i get more people you know wa- wanting to get involved it's it's amazing i don't know what that is but but anyhow hey this is my last question that i ask everybody tim it's this i'm an aspiring real estate agent i have 25 bucks what book should i go buy today Ooh. I would say um, if you if you don't own it yet, go buy Richest Man in Babylon. That that book I've read it twelve times. I, it it teaches you the basic financial concepts of money. It's the best book I've ever read as far as learning the basics about money. And, and who wrote that? I'm well, you you know you read it. Um, times. George S. Clayson, C L A S E N. Awesome. Well, again, if anybody, yeah. if you haven't read that book, but I, I'm sure most of you haven't, you can get a free copy just using our link. It's audibletrial.com slash superagentslive. Get it. And, uh, and uh, you know, if, if Tim's benefited from it, I'm sure you will too. Hey, Tim, uh, let everybody know where we can they can find you, and we'll sign off. Um, you can find me at Tim at TimRoad, R-H-O-D-E dot com. That's Tim at TimRoad dot com. Hey, Kobe, this has been a pleasure. I hope you people got a lot of good things out of it. And uh, appreciate you having me on, man. Yeah, no problems. And look, everybody, you know, if you've enjoyed your time here with uh, with Tim, reach out to him and say thank you. You know, I I, you know, I say thank you at the end of every episode. And, I, and again, if you get value out of this, you know, I mean, look. Everybody loves, you know, everybody loves it, right? And even David Osborne, man, he was, he blew up Twitter for a while. And I still, it's, it's weird. His episode goes on like spurts, like all of a sudden, well, he'll get four, you know, cause everybody's copies me on it, right? Four or five tweets a, a day and then it goes dark. And then, so anyhow, reach out to Tim, say thanks, Tim. Thanks, bud. Appreciate it. Looking forward to seeing you next month. Oh yeah. We're going to have fun in Steamboat with Go Bundance. Boom. All right. See you, bud. Bye-bye. Let's go. Luck. 20% skill, 15% concentrated power of